Hello and welcome once again. Let's talk about media and communication. Today we explore the relationship between two concepts, digital platforms and digital infrastructure. We welcome David Esmondalj from the University of Leeds in the UK, who will tell us about the rise of, uh, how the rise of platformization is having a profound impact on media and in culture. This conversation will draw on research from legal studies, uh, political economy, internet governance. David will uh, surely help us getting our rights uh, very briefly in order to understand how platformization is uh, disciplining infrastructures and narrowing the range of voices and perspectives that are heard. The case study, online music. So let's jump into it. David, welcome to our episode. Thank you, Rodrigo. It's nice to be here. So the first question for you would be, why uh, why is this topic important to conduct research on? I think digital infrastructure or infrastructure in general and, and platforms are concepts for our times. They've been very widely used in recent public debates uh, and in academic research, including media and communication studies. And yet I think there's a great deal of confusion about how those terms are used and so it's important to get clearer about them i think mm -hmm. and uh, so when you started this research um what were you hoping to find so what was the research gap there that you wanted to to address i think myself and my colleagues who i was working with my three co-authors mm -hmm. uh, wanted to to get that that clarity about how digital platforms and digital infrastructures have operated in the realm of culture, mm -hmm. historically, really. Um, I think we were all very conscious of some transitions in how the internet is, has been understood from a period of relative hope and optimism to one where the various products associated with, with the internet um, are now looked at um, as very problematic. And in particular, we wanted to look at that in relation to music because mm -hmm. that's what we research. And I think there's been a massive transformation in how music comes to us. Um, but not much seems to be understood about the digital platforms that underlie that transformation. So that's what we wanted to understand better. Mm -hmm. Uh, and please do share with us the main uh, reflections that you had when conducting this research. So the main findings, what, what are they? Well, I think the main argument is that the platformization of music, by which we mean the entry of music streaming platforms such as Spotify, mm -hmm. Apple Music, into the way we um, consume and or musicians and people working in the industry, how music is produced. It can be seen uh, historically as a closing down of the possibilities that were once made available by the principles underlying early internet infrastructure or architecture. And the by that, we really mean that the internet infrastructure that underpins our media and communication world was initially framed by its developers as a kind of common resource available to all, regardless of whether it was privately or publicly mm -hmm. owned. It's not about privatization. Mm -hmm. It's about a kind of commons. Mm -hmm. And I can talk a little bit, if you like, about the principles underlying that original vision of the internet that that made it like that and that were lost. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I think we can see uh, the rise of a highly centralized set of technologies, of technical protocols that are really about ease of use and the forbidding of the tinkering that characterized a lot of early digital activity mm -hmm. um, so we're tra we're tracing those transitions in the realm of music in a way that 
I don't think has been told before. Okay. I think it would be probably interesting for us to uh, follow up a little bit on this and to explore uh, what you suggested, how over time we lost these uh, comments that you make. Can you um, talk a little bit about that? Well, um, the original principles of the um, of internet architecture were uh, keeping it as, as simple as I can for now. Um, we're, uh, a fundamental feature was the end-to-end -end principle, uh, which really tried to protect um, end users from infrastructure providers putting restrictions on access and use. Um, so it's about not being able to distinguish between uh, different uses uh, or making uh, differential pricing based on, on how things will be used. And that produces this, well, what, what the writer Jonathan Zittron calls um, an ability to produce, he calls it generativity, an ability to produce unanticipated change um, from lots of different kinds of audiences and what happens is partly because of a panic about intellectual property mm -hmm. on the part of people who own intellectual property you get um, a set of legal measures that close down what what can happen uh, mainly happening in the u.s courts and then be ad adopted elsewhere but you also get these technological developments and in particular you get the development of what some people call uh, trusted systems which are kind of black, some people call, call them black boxed systems, devices that offer convenience and security, but that you can't get inside as a user. Um, and the iPhone would be the absolute classic example of that. Um, but at the same time, you get um, a suddenly burgeoning awareness of the value of data. Um, and that's particularly, that particularly follows the massive success of Google. Um, and that the massive data of that's required in that kind of platform model that develops out of uh, Google and these trusted devices um, re requires this massively centralized infrastructure system. And now that's essentially operated by Amazon, Google, and two other companies, uh, Microsoft. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the ownership is important, but it's as much the massive centralization of it uh, that we're, we're interested in. And of course, it's a good contextualization, the background of this, of this conversation. Let me take a step back. Um, so you mentioned before there were a lot still of public debates and a lot of confusion uh, about the relationship between the platforms and infrastructure. And I assume this also um, concerns um, public policy wise. So I'm curious to know more, how can these findings impact in terms of public policies? Um, so what can you tell us more about that, the real uh, implications in policy wise? Well, one thing I probably haven't stressed enough uh, in what I've said so far is that um, quite a substantial part of our paper is based on music. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, this is about the everyday production and consumption of music. So um, I guess the, the story of the music industry, the recorded music industry anyway, of the last 25 years or so is one where it was widely considered to be uh, doomed in the around the turn of the century or just after actually around to, by 2005 2010 you know the the revenues and profits of the of the recorded music companies were absolutely plummeting and and they were they were seen as you know dinosaurs doomed to extinction um but that didn't happen as it turns out um we saw the revival of those uh the people who own the copyrights in those companies um, so I think there's a story there for any uh, policymaker interested in understanding technological predictions and transformations that, first of all, predictions can go very awry. Things don't work out um, in the way people think they will. Um, and secondly, that 
the, 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 the systems that we end up with are the product of particular histories, particular developments. And um, the, um, the closing down of the multiplicity of making and sharing music that was there in the early internet is a, for, for me a really interesting version of that story mm -hmm. it involves many many different factors you know there's a complexity to there. there's a nuance um, as i say it's a mixture of legal and technological changes and nobody foresaw the way that the world of music would look they might mm -hmm. have seen that there was going to be um subscription which uh is the basis of uh, a lot of the business of music streaming but the development of these kind of digital platforms these closed systems built on the openness of the internet i i, I don't think anybody foresaw that uh, as, as arriving in anything like the way it did mm -hmm. of course and uh leaving now the uh the well, let's call the uh, the outside academia, the music companies and policymakers. So, what is ahead of uh, the researchers now to explore? Uh, probably helping in these projections of how technology and music technology will uh, um, make its evolution. So, what can we look ahead now in terms of research? Well, I imagine that the some of the research agenda on music uh, mm -hmm. and more generally on, on culture is going to be preoccupied by debates about generative artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. which of course has some relation to mm -hmm. the developments that we're talking about. But that, that's, uh, although we're beginning to see the beginnings of, of systems that are labeled artificial intelligence becoming more pervasive, I, th I think we still need to understand much better um, the, the world that we've got and how we came to have it. I think there's too much futurology in some publications about media and communication, it's too much prediction mm -hmm. and not enough grounding in the actual histories. Um, so I hope that future research will involve more uh, careful uh, uh, unpacking of historical developments. Mm -hmm. And I should say that I think one of the ways I, I see what we've we've done is, although we're in some ways primarily interested in in musical experience and the role of music in people's lives, be they musicians or ordinary users, as they're increasingly called, you know, people who just enjoy music. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's always been an interest of mine. I'm think of myself in part as a sociologist of music, but this paper attempted to look deeper, really, at the the systems that um, shape those experiences mm -hmm. in very indirect complicated ways um, and it seemed to me and I, I want to emphasize this that the way terms like infrastructure and platforms were being used was actually adding to confusion in a lot of cases about what the, what they were you know what because i think people often use the term infrastructure for example as some kind of metaphor for system mm -hmm. um, rather than using it in at least some 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 way related to its everyday use mm -hmm. as you know kind of those those technologies that enable um, uh, enable things to happen in soci society mm -hmm. some confusion of with the 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 concept and um, well the significance behind him um David, can you provide this is uh, so this touches upon several topics. So I believe there are some additional resources, some materials that you can share with us for our listeners to follow up and explore more. 
um, about music industry and uh, infrastructure and platforms. So is there anything you would like to share with us? Well, I think I can probably share with you, Rodrigo, um, uh, uh, resources that relate to how music is being transformed by mm -hmm. streaming mm -hmm. um, and, and how it's not, because in some ways people carry on using music in the way that they, they have for many years. Um, I, I'm not sure if there's uh, that many um, uh, approachable resources when mm -hmm. it comes to um, digital platforms and digital in infrastructures. Mm -hmm. They are technological and they're technical and they're often legal in their implications, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. And uh, if you want to provide them on your website. Exactly. Yes. Website. Um, for, well, if scrolling down for those who are listening to this conversation, scrolling down on the Let's Talk About Media and Communication website, you'll be able to access uh, these materials. But uh, again, it just emphasizes the relevance uh, of the article that we are discussing today. Um, you have done, David, let's wrap this episode up. You have done a bit of this several times in this episode, but I would like to ask you um, if there is anything you want our audience to remember about this talk, one, two sentences. So what would be the punchline of this conversation? The People are often quite dismissive of the hopes that, that were invested in the early internet, but that there was really something quite radical about the ideas underpinning it. Um, and that what we've seen since uh, uh, um, roughly the turn of the century has represented a, a closing down of the radical potential of those early ideas. Straight to the point, David. Thank you very much for this episode. Thank you, Rodrigo. For those who are uh, watching us on YouTube, you can go to our website. Let's talk about media and communication. You will be able to watch this episode there, access the article that served as base for this conversation. You can also listen to this episode wherever you get your podcasts. You can subscribe to our newsletter and stay in touch with, with new episodes. And of course, we are also on Twitter at Cogitatio LTA.